Well, as the search for a cure to COVID continues, the Federal Drug Administration is maintaining strict guidelines on the clinical development of any potential vaccines for the virus. And here to explain how the FDA plays a critical role in keeping us safe is the Commissioner of Food and Drugs, Dr. Stephen M. Hahn. And here to help break us down, break it all down for us is our very own Dr. Jen as well. So thank you so much, Commissioner Hahn, for being with us. We certainly appreciate it. Let's start with back to school. It's on the minds of so many parents and students, and we know that some school districts that had planned to go back to in-person learning have had to pivot and turn it all back to an online process. Can you tell us some of the treatments or tests that are out there that the FDA is looking at to ultimately return students back to school? You bet, and thanks for having me on, on the show. Really appreciate it. So um, we have a very robust uh, therapeutics treatments pipeline in the United States. Um, we have over 200 clinical trials of different therapeutic agents, as well as 500 in the queue uh, to be looked at. So we know this virus is still with us. We know that the most important thing we do at this point are those common sense public health measures. Um, but the bottom line is there are many therapeutics out there for us. Um, Certainly remdesivir and dexamethasone, a very common steroid, are available now. Convalescent plasma is being studied on an expanded access program. And as you know, there's been a big push for donation. We're waiting to see in the efficacy of that, uh, but we know it's safe, and so doctors are ordering it. And then finally, we have a number of monoclonal antibodies, which are specific antibodies that have been used in the past for other infectious diseases and have worked. And they're in clinical trial now, and we have great hope for those because they can be scaled up. Uh, significantly it can be used both as a treatment, but also as a, as a prophylaxis, a preventative, and act as a bridge to vaccine development. And Steve, going from treatments to testing, still uh, such a patchy uh, process for so many here in the U.S. Specifically, I want to ask you about saliva testing. Um, there's such an appeal for that because potentially it could give us a result much more quickly than other types of testing. Where are we in terms of saliva testing? How accurate is it? And when do you think it'll be more available on a widespread basis? Yeah, the, the advantage of saliva testing is, number one, it can be done at home. All you have to do is put saliva in a cup. And secondly, um, it is uh, something that can be used uniformly as opposed to the nasal swab. So you may know that we uh, authorized this weekend the use of a, a diagnostic approach, a, a test approach using saliva. Um, the, that came from Yale. Um, and the folks at Yale have an EUA, which is pretty broad. The EUA means emergency use authorization. So they have a pretty broad license. They can actually use this now um, under their, their authorization with a variety of different tests. That includes what you're talking about, which is point of care tests, which can be done in 15 or 20 minutes. But also that saliva test can be used in the more common laboratory test that's hospital-based. And so we expect that there'll be an expansion uh, of the saliva-based test based upon this emergency use authorization that we issued on Saturday. Really good news in terms of expanding it, and hopefully we'll address the issues that you brought up that have been problematic up till now. Commissioner Hahn, I know you just mentioned convalescent saliva, uh, plasma, excuse me, and you said it's safe to use. The efficacy is still being studied at this point. Do you foresee that the FDA will eventually authorize this as a standard of care? So, so we do know, you're right, that plasma is safe. There's been a number of publications showing that. Um, we're waiting on the efficacy data. And, and, Jen, that is going to be completely dependent upon what the data and science show us. We have some early reads on that that suggest that this convalescent plasma, that is taking plasma from someone who's recovered from COVID-19 and giving it to someone who's sick with COVID-19. We have early evidence that it's effective, but we're waiting for some more definitive data. And it is possible, although I can't speculate because I don't know what those data are at this point, it is possible that we could issue an emergency use authorization. And I think it's also important to remember that doctors have been using convalescent plasma for many, many years, close to 100 years to treat uh, infectious diseases. So there's a very tr long track record of its use. And Steve, Amy and I have been talking for a long time on this show and in ABC News in general about the racial disparities that this virus has really unmasked, um, not only in terms of risk of severe disease and death 
amongst brown and black populations, but testing. Um, moving into the issue of vaccine development, what can you tell us about how the FDA is looking at different ethnic and racial groups specifically in terms of developing that, the vaccine, looking at the data from the clinical trials, and even down the road authorizing various treatments specifically with an eye on race? Jen, this, and Amy, this is such a critical question. As you know, in late June, we issued guidance uh, where we gave information to the de vaccine developers about what FDA expected to see. In addition to sort of setting a floor for the efficacy, the effectiveness of the vaccine, we also uh, very much insisted upon the fact that diverse uh, volunteer populations had to be in the clinical trials. And the reason that's important is because when the data come to us, if the data show safety and effectiveness, our gold standard for vaccines, we want to make sure that that information is generalizable to all of America. So we want the clinical trials for vaccines to look like all of America. So what's going on right now with FDA is that we're working very closely with the vaccine manufacturers. One of the things that we're doing to try to expedite the process is a rolling review. So we're looking at the data from the phase three, the latest clinical trials every week. And we're looking at who's being enrolled. Do you have elderly uh, volunteers? Do you have uh, racial um, and ethnic minorities uh, uh, volunteers in the trials. And if there are any uh, significant variations from what our expectations are, we'll work with the, with the sponsors to, to, to help uh, correct those. It is so very important because at the end of the day, our gold standard about safety and efficacy has to be generalizable. And we really have to consider the most vulnerable in our populations when we talk about who this vaccine should be given to. And if the FDA received clinical trial phase three data today, what level of efficacy for a vaccine, um, Dr. Hahn, would you grant EUA or approval to? 50%, 55%, what are you looking for? So in our guidance, we said that what we were looking for is a floor of 50%. Now, everybody wants a vaccine tomorrow, and everyone wants 100% vaccine effectiveness. And Jen, you and I know virtually nothing, maybe nothing in medicine is 100%, but what we're looking at is a floor. Now, what that does is it allows the clinical trials to be developed um, so that they know that they, they'll need to detect that effectiveness. And it gives them a sense of how many volunteers to have in the trial. So 50% is the floor that we've established, but of course, we wanna see even greater efficacy if in fact the data show that. So we've been really clear with the vaccine manufacturers about that. And Commissioner, I know you've been very vocal about maintaining a zero pressure political policy towards any approval of treatments or vaccine. But I'm curious, how do you balance that with what the president is calling Operation Warp Speed to find an effective and safe vaccine? So it's very clear, and, and I want to be clear uh, with, with everyone who's listening, um, FDA is an independent regulatory body. We have over 17,000 scientists, doctors, nurses, pharmacists who help us make these decisions. They've been doing these for years. And our vaccine division is incredible. They have scientists uh, that, that just have world's expertise here. Now, there is a very bright line between Operation Warp Speed and FDA. We provide technical assistance, information, guidance to all manufacturers and developers of vaccines, including Operation Warp Speed. But FDA is not involved in that decision making. We will look at data from manufacturers of vaccines inside and outside of Operation Warp Speed, and we will make the same decision using the same rigorous criteria, regardless of where those data come from. And so I think your point's really well taken. This bright line that we've established, our regulatory independence, our non-involvement in the decision-making regarding which vaccine to move forward versus the other is critical, because at the end of the day, the American people have to have confidence and trust that FDA is only using the science and data. And I can assure them that we will not cut corners on that. And lastly, Steve, before your role as head of the FDA, you were a practicing cancer physician. Um, I think that comes across in a lot of your language. How has that role helped you um, in terms of patient care and direct human contact and what you're doing now with the FDA? So as a doc, and you know this, you can never lose sight um, of who, who's the most important part of the relationship, and that is the patient and a doctor-patient relationship. And having had that experience on the front line, taking care of patients just like you have, 
gives you a perspective about what people's fears are, what their concerns are. I've said before, and I'll say again, we want to give hope, just like you would to any patient that's in front of you, but you don't want to give false hope. And you want to set realistic expectations and give the right information. To me, it's all about being as transparent as the law will allow us to be, and also to give as much information so that we can allay people's fears. So to, I think it's been enormously helpful for me as FDA commissioner, um, and I rely upon it often when communicating with people about, about all the issues that face us. Because at the end of the day, the American people, um, if you will, are the, 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 the patient of FDA. Those are the people that, that are, we're working for every day in our important public health mission. We certainly appreciate all of your hard work and your time today as well. Dr. Stephen M. Hahn, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Amy. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.